Our next conversation is going to be about um, the march against femicide that took place over the weekend. And then the conversation continues in what happens thereafter, what led to this, what's happening in the country. We are joined by two uh, ladies. Edita Ocheng is a feminist activist and a member of the Africans Rising. And Ruth Ambogo is a lawyer and governance and policy expert. Good morning, Editor and Ruth. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the hot seats of the Situation Room. Asante. We call this the uh, Kenya's biggest conversation. Karibuni sana. We have a lot to talk about in terms of what's been happening in the country, what happened over the weekend, and what happens going forward. But to welcome you to the conversation, CT has the day's problem. Every week, CT goes across Africa, settles in one country, picks up proverbs, and then he brings up he brings us one proverb a day from that country. This week, courtesy of EcoBank, the Pan-African Bank, City is in Zimbabwe. Yes, I am. Mm. Africa has 54 countries. EcoBank is in 33 of these 54 countries mm. and has affiliate offices in France, believe it or not, China, Dubai, UK. Now, an African bank has gone international, mm. and it is. Mm -hmm. Now, the proverb from Zimbabwe. I will read the proverb, and then, ladies, I will ask you what you think <laughs> it means. Mm. Very simple. Okay? A grilled locust is better than no soup. I'm looking at you directly. <laughs> and it <has> starts. <laughs> I'm not good with proverbs. Please, root start. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is another proverb. What is the proverb? I am I'm not, not good with proverbs. proverbs. <laughs> Are you suggesting that I am very old enough to understand proverbs? <laughs> you don't need to be old. The beauty of asking your opinion is we just want your opinion. That's it. Mm. You said a grilled locust, locust is, is better, better than, than no soup. Eish. Grilled locust is better than no soup. Mm -hmm. Just um, your understanding mm, of it. I think uh, traditionally we prefer we prefer meals with soup. We prefer the good things of life. Mm. So I think what the proverb means is that sometimes accept what you get as opposed to what you hoped you would have. I think that's that's what it means in my pers perspective. That's pretty good. What do you think? Um, I was just reflecting, but I know I'm problematic <laughs> when you talked about a grilled <laughs> locust is better than no, no soup, soup, right? No right? Soup, yes. Yeah. And uh, already I'm looking at these locusts like it is gauged, uh, caged somewhere and anyone can take advantage of it. That is what I'm thinking. That is what is anyway. in my mind. Yeah. Thank you. And you don't like the idea of grilling that locust yeah. at all from the very beginning. You <laughs> we were wrong the moment we started grilling the locust. The locust should be free to fly away to isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Why are you grilling the locust? Why are you grilling the locust? <laughs> ah. mm -hmm. Editor, now let's start with understanding your organization. You're a member of Africans Rising. What's that? Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself to the people of Kenya. My name is Editor. I'm a feminist activist, and all the time I say, I'm a feminist witch from Kibra University, a school of experience with paperless degree. Witch, and like with the long pointy hat, that witch? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, I'm a member of African Rising. We work in 54 countries in Africa, and for us, our matters is on human rights, peace, dignity, and justice. Yeah. Uh, Editor, you've been here before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we want to now hear more of your views on this particular matter. And thank you for coming again. Thank you so much. Yes. Karibu sana. We will talk about what happened on, on Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. Ruth. Yes. Governance and policy expert. Mm -hmm. We get very many of those here. Yes. We never quite understand what it means. <laughs> 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 What's your interpretation of what you say you are? <laughs> well, uh, being a governance and policy expert basically means that uh, you have interacted with government policies, uh, either from an ana analytical point of view, where on a weekly basis you're analyzing what government is doing you are providing your opinion on the same uh, well thought out opinion so 
I think I am amongst the very first young people who started using that title because I started being on media, analyzing politics and uh, governance issues at a very young age, probably some eight or nine years ago when I was still very young. And uh, as a result of that, I have gained perspective into what government does, how the same affects society, and um, how, and, and, and when I'm analyzing the same, I tend to provide the perspective, I tend to come in with the perspective of how should we do things differently, or how should government do things differently. Mm. I, sometimes when you, when you use that title, people ask you, so what's the effect of your work? I mean, is it, uh, is it just a title you're using to uh, put up a face? I mean, is it just a, f a title you're putting to your face when you're on media? Mm. Or is there any impact to your work on media and even out of the media spaces within the governance space? Yeah. So I think for me, I have seen in the past some of my work on media, some of my commentaries on media actually re leading to real change on the issues that we have spoken about while on air. I remember there's a time, an example I like to give is that there's a time the government was considering way back, I think in 2018 or 20, between 2017 and 2018, the Uhuru Kenyatta's administration was, was considering uh, re reducing, increasing the amount of money Kenyans were going to pay on NHIF and uh, reducing the services that Kenyans would get out of NHIF. So... We were, on, we were on air that day and it appears that no other media house captured that conversation. So we were the only ones ha having that conversation on media, on one particular media station that tends to have a huge following. So we really spoke about it and I remember I really came out very passionately about how the same effect will affect the common and ordinary Monainchi. And the station received phone calls even from uh, government entities and then the very next day, in fact it didn't even take the next day, the very same day a directive was issued that totally reversed, you know, completely reversed the decision that government was going to make. So for me, that really showed me the impact of my work mm -hmm. as somebody who is analyzing government policy, as somebody who is providing direction, as somebody who is looking for change uh, in terms of the commentaries and opinion that I give on media regarding government policies. And then also uh, outside the space of media, I run an organization called Center for Advocacy and Awareness on the Rights of Youth in Africa, where... Um, we have provided direction on so many issues. For example, when the budget uh, is read, we provide our opinion on the same as young people. When issues come up, we provide our opinion on the same. We have done press conferences before, which I want to believe have informed some of the government opinion, I mean, government decisions moving forward. Mm. So when somebody says, or I don't know about the rest, because maybe the rest copied the title from some of us who started it. But I mean, for me, I have seen the impact of the work that I do as a government, uh, as a governance and policy expert. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's talk about what happened over the weekend. So we saw many people pour out the streets and it was for one specific reason. It was a march against femicide. Who were the organizers of this, if you know, and what was the reason behind it? Should I start? We'll start with you. Uh, well, then we'll come to editor. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, I did not attend the match. Mm. <laughs> I was away in the village um, <clears throat> trying to activate my political ambitions for 2027 <laughs> too early. As uh, Sakaja says, my payment your best. I was back in the village in Vihiga County attending a funeral here and there and church services mm. and just uh, doing a, one or two development projects back at home. But I had intended to attend the match. So um, how I would say that I know the organizers of the match is that... Uh, Sometime last week, I was approached, actually last week on sun, the other Sunday, I was approached by a lady who is very active in the feminist space and she asked me to host an online webinar conversation about the femicide, uh, the femicide cases that are ongoing. And I happened to get to know who the organizers of this match were. And uh, they were basically organizations, uh, femi feminist, feminist and feministic in nature kind of organizations that came together and organizations that champion the rights of women uh, that came together to say enough is enough that in uh, their opinion this had escalated and uh, there needed some there needed to be something that needed to be done so the organizations were quite a lot i saw feminists in kenya some of them i could only get their abbreviations because as i was hosting the webinar i would be told okay so this organization is in charge i knew of uh, usikimia being part of it mm. uh, i knew of young women i think leadership 
Leadership Institute being part of it. Uh, from a government perspective, when I was now observing the match as it was taking place, I could see that uh, NGAF was involved. Uh, I could see that, uh, you know, women leaders were involved. Mm. So, and also the creative societies, the, cre the creative space, for once, I would say, came out in, um, in, in, in support of this conversation. In mm. the past, the creative space tends to shy away from such conversations because, you know, the creative uh, people are always protecting their brands. So I could see they came out in uh, large numbers. And not only did the match happen in Nairobi, but the match took place in various parts of the country. Some of the, uh, some of the parts of the country started their matches, I think, on Friday. Like I saw Nyeri started on Friday, did theirs on Friday, but in Nairobi the same happened on Saturday. So it was a culmination of very many organizations that came together mm. and said enough is enough. Editor, why? Um, as we know, personally, I'm really angry with whatever is happening. I love mm. to share my feelings all the time. Mm. And it's really sad. Uh, and I think everyone knows the reason why we came to the streets and uh, used one voice. And our voice was to end femicide. And this is something that didn't start on Saturday. We started like six years ago when... Most of the women were killed, but what agitated us was the killing of Sharon uh, in Homer Bay mm -hmm. and how people talked about Sharon in a very negative way. And as we were looking at ourselves as women and so vulnerable. So when we were on the street, when we were saying justice for Sharon, we were only nine people on the streets fighting for justice for Sharon. Uh, later, we went to the street again on 9th March 2019 on uh with total shutdown ke with feminists in kenya and gaf we came together and we were around 500 women talking about femicide and why we were working and then later the government came together they organized a, a prayer meeting which was problematic again because everyone was saying like young girls you're misbehaving you love money mm -hmm. and it was just blaming the victim all the time and nobody talked to the perpetrators uh, and that was in, it was a very high level meeting for the government. We were there and we were really angry because they took away our efforts on the streets every single day, fighting against femicide in this country. And they didn't give us opportunity even to talk about real issues on the ground. And we were really angry. So on Saturday, when again it happened, now the scarlet issue, we were mad because as we work with sex workers, we work with different women. As women, a woman is a woman. Like, we don't, uh, we are not biased when it comes to women. And uh, we gathered ourselves together and we said, no, we need to do something. And the first thing that we are doing is pushing back. And pushing back because also we, uh, we follow what constitution says, says all the time. And for us, it was uh, something peaceful and it was a match. So when we came together, we built a community among ourselves and uh, we used WhatsApp group actually to mobilize. It was not easy and uh, everyone participated and we were like, we need to do this thing around the country. And everyone coordinated themselves in different, in different counties and that is what happened on Saturday. And I loved the face of this match because it was so organic. We started from the grassroots level grassroots women that are not funded i'm telling you the truth we are not funded by anyone mm. we are problematic i told you that <laughs> so so, ma so many donors don't like our politics so all the time we work organically we work passionately to end violence against women and yes some people will fund us some people who are like ah, this politics is a good politics because we are bit we are not a bit radical i'll say we are radical on matters of women mm -hmm. so coalition of grassroots human rights defenders feminists in kenya yauli Usikibie, feminist center in Kibra, and wild feminists. Jointly, we came together and said, uh uh, this is here to and the But Lazima to stop it, and we are going in the streets and we are mobilizing. Mm -hmm. Manze, we mobilized for the last two weeks. I was in Kibra every single day, speaking one, I don't know, it's a case <laughs> one on one to women, telling them the reason why we need to attend the match. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the narrative and the victim blaming everywhere, uh, especially at the grassroots level whereby narrative goes like Shwa. everyone was like you know it is sex worker women that are being killed and now I was asking women about the, uh, the, the young 
girl who was killed in Kisumu was shot by the police. Young women and women who have been killed by their spouses in Kibra and they could relate and they were like, no, we are attending the match. Because the only thing I was telling these women, we are next. Personally in Kibera, a gang group of more than 150 men sat down and they said, I'm supposed to be chased from the community. <laughs> and it was not easy. And it brought a lot of insecurity from at individual level and even it extended to my family and the people that I work with. Why? What are they saying? Uh, they say I spread immorality in the community oh. because I defend family, LBQ, our people and sex workers. Another thing they say is uh, I'm a homebreaker. This one is said internationally mm. because I'm against gender-based violence and any woman that I've talked to and they were uh, they were kept hostage in a violent relationship left they will leave that relationship because they will be like i'm liberated i'm leaving this relationship and mostly men and communities don't take it positively okay and that is the reason why constantly we want to push this government mm. to ensure that femicide is a national issue mm. yeah so one message that came out very clearly and it was you know interesting to see that there was a coming together of several organizations communities individuals but the message was stop killing us right mm -hmm. stop killing us and in each of these incidents that you point to um somebody has died a woman has died and for in a lot of that we can we can point to you know there were relational issues there were intimacy issues uh, in a relationship with somebody else mm -hmm. right so there are very many layers to all of this. Mm -hmm. Who was this message targeted at? Stop killing us. Who are we speaking to when we say stop killing us? We were speaking to first ourselves and then to the community. But again, we were direct to the men, Kenyan men, because we realized out of one, more than 546 women that have been killed, most of them were killed by their in intimate partners. Mm -hmm. And all of them were men. All of them were men. Not like those who are in homosexual relationship that there was women. Mm -hmm. So we realized we need to speak out. Personally, I speak to my partner all the time. Please, when I'm going to sleep in the night, I remind him, don't kill me. Women are wow. being killed in this country. And I do that intentionally for him now, even to make him uncomfortable so that at least he can speak out and speak to the fellow men. And uh, when we are speaking directly to the men, but again, we are reminding Kenyan men, because right now, uh, looking at everything that happened and how it has really shifted, we realized West African men, especially from Nigeria and Ghana, are killing Kenyan women and men in Kenya are silent. They're using women's bodies for ritual. And women are already vulnerable. You get? So again, was somebody else that we are speaking to was the government. We need to hold the government accountable. We are citizens of this country. And if I'm secure, if I'm living in a place that I'm not safe as a citizen of this country, how will I participate in our development activities? What about the girls that are coming? Human trafficking is all over. The government knows and they're silent. Especially right now, I'm really mad with the executive and even judiciary. All these people are silent watching women being killed in this country. Especially like women like me who are everywhere at the grassroots level mm -hmm. and uh, the policies doesn't favor us all the time when it comes to security, matters of security mm -hmm. of this country. So we are speaking to ourselves, we are speaking to international communities, we are speaking to the government, and we want to make the government accountable, because women's lives matters. Editor, is this a men versus women thing? No, it is not a men versus women thing, because I know also women who are misogynist, and uh, three months ago in Kibra, a young girl stabbed a woman. A man? A woman, oh. yeah. Why? She's already in Langata prison. So this woman allegedly alimtukana na status zake za HIV and she was already mad. She, she was mad and uh, initially she was not recovered when alijua status yake HIV. Now this woman 
alimtukana akasikia vibaya akamdunga kisu it tells you also we have women wenye wanaua wanawake wenzake so it is so not is, is it is it a, a gender issue is it a human issue this is now specifically on femicide mm. this is a gender issue i think uh, well i think that um, the conversation is a gender issue mm. and uh, when we when we speak about gender i think especially when you when you talk about gender to men mm. they take it as if gender is women's issues mm. forgetting that gender is men, men and women mm. so at the moment the conversation is about who is actually killing these women mm. you know i was in a conversation a whatsapp conversation group yesterday till very late in the night while on my way to nairobi very late in the night the conversation was about uh, the men in the group saying women need to need to stop immorality without really b telling us about what the men who are killing these women should do and i remember i tasked somebody and uh one of the persons who was in this conversation asked me so what is your definition so what is the, the root cause of all these problems and asked me what is the, my definition of femicide mm -hmm. and i told him that the root cause of all this problem the problem we are facing today is the availability of men who are ready to kill women at the slightest provocation because if we truly did not have men killing women we would not be speaking about femicide so the real issue is that there are men killing women for whichever reasons that we can talk about later but there are men killing women at the okay, moment okay yes okay is it men killing women because they are women yeah mm -hmm. yes it is so men killing women a because man they specifically are women. targeting a woman to kill a woman because of her gender yeah yeah is that what we are dealing with now Yes. That is what we are dealing with now Examples, and a cocktail of please. other issues. Mm -hmm. And a cocktail of other issues. When I say men killing women because they are women is because what the, the point we are trying to put across is look at how our society thinks about women. How society views women or rather how some members of the society and men for that matter tend to view women as the weaker gender. Mm. And therefore, you know, it gives them a through pass to do whatever it is they wish to do to these women. And I keep saying that femicide is not just a one-time, it is not a one-time thing where somebody wakes up and says, I want to kill this woman. It's a chain of reactions or a chain of events that eventually leads up to this man killing this woman. It begins with, we are in a relationship. First of all, most of the femicide cases that take place in this country are intimate partner kind of cases. Mm -hmm. Where it is not just a random man who woke up and decided to kill a woman. It is a man who has been in a relationship sort of setup with this woman whether be it uh, a marriage setup or be it a relationship boyfriend girlfriend setup mm. or be it even a sexual kind of relationship where you know it's, it's just benefits a beneficial kind of uh, relationship mm. and then something happens and along the way this woman gets killed but when you do your investigations mm. you find that there has been there has been a, 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 a very um deliberate or very weird kind of engagement between these two people that leads up to this femicide for the women in ma marital relationships you find that these are women who for a long period of time have persisted or gone through violence keeping quiet about it or even trying to resolve the same but not finding a conclusive solution to the same such as walking away and then eventually they get killed you know when a man now gets to a point where um, they are either so emotionally disturbed or so pushed to the wall and they end up killing the woman in a relationship again the same set of environment or circumstances tend to present themselves you are in a relationship where there is some to level of toxicity that you keep avoiding where there is some level of leo ume, ume chapwa kidogo you've been slapped a bit and you you still stay there and for young women mostly some of them tend to stay in these relationships because of the um money factor and power imbalance where you're you're saying my livelihood depends on this relationship mm. so if i'm in this relationship no matter what happens to me i will persist for example the case that she has given of uh, young women who have been killed by the uh, west african men uh, in kenya I'd most like of this relationship please yes. let's just pause there for a second yes is it conclusive is it certain that these men come from west africa no i, I said an example i was giving an example yeah, but of the nature any. of relationships that take place between west african men and the, and, and Can young you, kenyan women yeah. which one the reality is? of what city is asking yes and you're a lawyer yes is it conclusive 
it isn't conclusive okay but the examples of what happens in these relationships normally most of the times it is that you find these west african men being providers in the relationship mm. and the young girls who are dating or engaging with them are young girls who sorry to say most of the times also tend to be in a situation where they are not so economically empowered mm. so when they get into this we are speaking about realities now mm. okay. when they get into these relationships how many times do you hear of cases where we are just saying now the example of the west african okay. men there is also kenyan men the kenyan men mentality which also tends to be the same mm. where if a man is a provider and a woman is in a vulnerable situation economically they do not pay attention to what happens in this relationship whether they are beaten whether they are slapped whether they are violated they will stay there because they feel like they are vulnerable you so know? It's, a, it's a question of the imbalance in power okay. exactly yeah. and that imbalance in power would lead to violence would lead to violence and that violence could become Same fatal thing. violence okay. exactly so the march on saturday and there was a message mm. who was the intended recipient of that message all of us I said that before, mm. but again, we are also directing it to the government, the state, specifically executive, and all the arms of the government. Um, Kenya, the way we are, we are taxpayers, all of us, as Kenyan, and we know that. And uh, we are thinking of making the government accountable, because the government, uh, in 20, around 2022, if I'm not wrong, Uru Kenyatta was in Paris and uh, he made some of the commitment of uh, protecting women uh, during, what was the name of that meeting? I'm not sure, but I know the, the Security Council resolution. Yeah, also that, mm -hmm. which Kenya was hosting last year. And uh, we, he talked about like he's going to ensure that gender-based violence will end in, in GBV by 2023. 2026. 2026. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we are looking at it right now, and it's really high, mm. and it has really escalated, and women are being killed in this country. Mm -hmm. So we want to communicate to all of us individ at individual level, but we want the state to do something, and that's why we have our own demands. For example, the first demand we are telling the government is to ensure that they are calling this femicide out to be a national security issue. But our president is still silent up to today, mm -hmm. and it makes us angry every single day okay. because the day when we were marching on saturday we lost two women one was 60 years and another one was a young woman at around 20 to 24 years so it tells you how these cases are really rampant and we need to constantly speak about femicide in this country okay yeah. i personally i mean i felt like the messaging needed to be a bit more uh, tailored to the right agent agencies mm. because i feel like there's a level of conversation where you can say well if we are saying stop killing us at what platforms can we have the conversation of stop killing us if the message is directed to the perpetrators of these deaths i feel like uh, the more you keep saying stop killing us I, I i'm not trying to water down the march that took place because i as somebody who understands political movements as somebody who understands how um, agitation in the past you know uh, demonstrations in the past have actually led to fruits uh, and, and 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 have led to real change in the past mm. historically ever since demonstrations began we've seen the value of demonstrations in bringing about societal change mm. i am not here to water down the efforts of the women who marched on saturday but i'm saying that sometimes we must be conscious of what platforms do we have these conversations and what messaging do we pass across in these platforms because when you're trying to tell a perpetrator stop killing us or future perpetrators potential perpetrators stop killing us at a match you sort of give them an avenue for them to also come up with their excuses to shout louder their excuses mm -hmm. because in the whatsapp forum where we were yesterday mm. it seemed to be men versus women mm. women saying stop killing us men saying stop being immoral you know and it became i loved the conversation at that platform because we could actually deconstruct each other's thoughts mm. because when a man would say stop being immoral i'd come in and say who determines what immorality is to begin with okay. so is immorality reduced to engaging in sexual um activities beyond let's say marriage if that is what they define it as or you know uh, money being involved in the same sexual context as we speak and if that is immorality according to the men 
where does that leave other forms of vices that naturally qualify as immorality? Let's I would it, ask yeah. the question, for instance, mm. to me, lying is immorality. So I asked the man who was saying, let the women stop immorality. I asked him, so if, I fight, if you lie to me, should I kill you? You know, mm. and you know, I feel like in such conversation, in such setups, mm. it is easy to have the conversation of stop killing us because we can then say, you will tell me, for instance, that um, the women need to stop uh, being hungry for money and be patient in life and uh, be patient in life and work hard for what they want. And I'd ask you, so what about the Bentens of the society, Sh the ones who are also pretty much under the same circumstances of wanting money too quick, yeah. should they be killed? Mm. And then also I'd also ask you the question such as, if you say these women deserve to die and they will continue dying for as long as they're hungry for money and the same, you know, the immorality question again, I also opposed the question that um, should that, and who, who gave men the authority or the killers the authority to kill these people they so purport to be immoral? Let me assist you here. Yes. Go back into history. You know, most Kenyans purport to be Christians. So let's use a Christian analogy. Mm. John 8, the book of John 3 to 11, the teachers of the law brought a woman and they said this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Yes. Okay? Knelt down, wrote on the sand and said, okay, he who does not have any sin, let that person be the first. Uh -huh. You trust on. And people melted away and yes. the conversation went on and said, is there anyone here who's accusing? He says, no. And he says, even I don't accuse you. Mm. They were quoting the Torah. Their religious book authorized them to kill a woman caught in adultery. It does not mention what you do to the man who was, oh, this, was exactly. this woman. It doesn't mention. Mm. So this bias against women goes back a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It didn't start yesterday. Yes. It's been accepted societally that women should be treated unfairly. If women had been treated fairly, affirmative action, feminism would never have reared its head. Yeah. It's the realization that no, we're being we're being given the short end of the stick here. Yeah. Okay. And yet our contribution is as real as everybody else's. Mm. Now, how do you get people to actually look at this thing and understand that because someone wants money, because someone is sex work, is that a reason for someone to be killed? You know, and that's that's the conversation that we should be having in platforms that, sorry to say, uh, editor, that are not very, because you know, an uh, um, a march is sort of like. A very loud and very aggressive environment mm. it's a very loud and very aggressive environment where you give the perpetrator chance to also come back come back to you in a very loud and very aggressive manner remember boniface mwangi posted a clip the other day uh, of a conversation at jivanji where the men were saying we will continue killing you mm. you know so it, women are saying stop killing us the men are saying we will continue killing you so for me i felt that this platform that the feminists in Kenya and all the other women of goodwill had should have been used to pass probably a message to a different target audience, which to me, in my view, should be the government and government entities and our leaders who stand at a position of making real change, coming up with real policies, make it, making real resolutions that would protect the citizens. But you've achieved it. If it wasn't loud... Exactly. Yes. Why would we be having this conversation? And again, for me, I, I don't think that uh, the approach we took was not the best. At that point, you know, as a human being, when you are reacting, you react differently. And remember, everything started organically. Everything started organically. And we said, for example, if a woman is killed in Kibra, where do you go and report? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, they'll just keep quiet. Even mm -hmm. the relative, they'll go bury that woman and they keep quiet. But at least some of us who are a bit like informed, we know where to go. But most of the women, even in the village, if somebody's killed closer to them, they go, so many cases goes unreported. And for me, that was alarming. That was what we were thinking and that is what we did. So I want to agree with Ruth when, when she's saying, Conversation needs to take different shifts at different level. At our level, that was what we could do. You know, but, uh, because if, personally, if, I've yes. never seen our member of parliament speaking yeah. against this thing. So where do I meet him? You know, if you don't speak loudly, you know you can't be heard. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. Let's look at maybe some things here. And, you know, the, the thing about this is that um, femicide, any kind of death, 
weighs heavily on the emotion. Mm. We cannot run away from that. That is true. Mm. Yes. When we look at violence of any nature, it doesn't matter. It weighs heavily on the emotion. So there is a temptation to sensationalize it and not look for the solution. That mm. is true. Okay? Now, let's look at something as horrible as rape. Mm -hmm. And let's look at communities whereby they made this intimate power tool public okay one of the ways in which rape for example gains its strength or gains its uh yeah strength it's, mo it's momentum this momentum mm -hmm. is because it is you overpower another individual mm. in a private setting yes and you hold that information you retain power so over hidden. that person it's yes hidden. Yeah. Now, one of the ways they were able to deconstruct it in certain communities was made it public. Yes. Well, let's take Johannesburg for an, mm -hmm. for an example. Women were raped 10, 15 cases and of they, rape an hour. Not daily. An wow. hour in Johannesburg. There was a part of the city that you could not walk in. Daylight, nighttime, didn't matter. Somebody would drag you into an alley and that was it. But what did they do? They made it public, yes. open. And said, we know this is going on here, just like you're saying. People in government came out and said, look, we know this is happening. Shun this thing publicly. And that's why I asked the question, to whom are we making this message known? Because if we talk about it on a Saturday afternoon and we have a march, it, I mean, look, the noise mm. is absolutely necessary. But I think one of the questions that we're asking today is, then what happens? After the that noise. is exactly what I was addressing. Yes. What happens next? Yes. Because mm. we still have aggressors who are saying, yeah, well, yeah, you can so be. What? So what? You yeah. had a march. So streets, what? Ten days. If you mess up with me, I will I kill will you. Kill you. Yes. It doesn't matter. Yes. Now, we must also realize that it is not an immediate action. Mm. You don't have a conversation with somebody today and in the evening at four o'clock they kill you. No, no. They mm. don't kill you today. Mm. It's built up. It's momentum. It gathers steam over time yeah mm. so what is it that must be done so that as this thing is gathering steam it is in the mind of the individual that okay you know what i cannot kill this person and get away with it exactly that's what i was talking about when i was saying that the platform was good but the message needed to be to different target audi audiences there was a, there should have been a message there should have been the stop killing us message which was properly you know put out there but then beyond over and above stop killing us there should have been a stronger message as well yeah a loud message to the government yeah for instance there should have been a call to the cabinet secretary um kithure kindiki that as you are i mean when 10 people are killed at the border of kisumu and uh, kericho within two days because it is a political matter it becomes a national crisis and Kithure Kindiki speaks about it. During this match, there should have been an even louder message to Kithure Kindiki that if you cannot guarantee the safety of women in this country, then we don't need you to continue sitting holding that position. Mm. Mm. At that particular match, there should have been an even grander message to women leaders who did not attend that match. Mm. The question of where are you? In this conversation, where are you? Hmm. There should have been an even louder message to these legislators, not just women, but even the male legislators, that we are giving you an ultimatum of, let's say, two months or three months to come up with legislation, to reform legislation, to ensure that femicide is no longer being uh, categorized under the same category that we categorize murder, crimes of passion. Can we have a separate law that criminalizes femicide and places a totally different um, sentence, for instance, to it and consequences for the people who are found culpable for the same. Okay. Under the same breath, hmm. there should have been a conversation about moving forward as women, as this feminist movement, as the women who are uh, disgusted by this. How do we bring on board men and have these conversations extended beyond the loud and public setting that's a good point now let's yes. ask a question and mm. it's going to be uncomfortable but we cannot ignore it because it's in these conversations right yeah it's, it's okay okay there are men and women not just men mm. 
who are on the other side of the spectrum today and look let's let me set a caveat here that there is no justification doesn't matter what it is for taking the life of another human being okay yes but there are those on the other side of the spectrum who say you know what you can't irritate me to this point whereby you're asking for money, you're dressed the way you like, you show up at places, and then I find that you're also in another uh, commitment, relationship, whatever, with somebody else. But you're taking these things from me, and sometimes you don't even show up. I think there's even a slang for it today, mm -hmm. right? Coucou l'affaire. Exactly. <laughs> these are sentiments coming from blood-thumping human beings. Yeah. They're not animals. They feel something, they feel it, and they feel that it is unfair. Again, no justification for taking another life. But how, editor, do we deal with that sentiment? Okay, first of all, I want to respond to Ruth because what you are saying about what we could have done, we have 17 demands to the government specifically on what they need to do. But again, Having more than 10,000 people on the street that we were not expecting, it was not easy to manage. Everything that was planned was planned organically, without enough funds. You can even listen to my voice. I'm really struggling to speak today. Mm -hmm. It was not easy at all. There is nobody. This was the first time when Kenyan women and young people came together and men against femicide, a match that consists 10, more than 10,000 people. So it was not easy and we have our demands today mm -hmm. and some of my colleagues are going to the Ministry of Gender. Uh, they're going to meet uh, Kidure and uh, different uh, cabinets mm -hmm. today, this Monday. Okay. So a lot is happening behind the cut, uh, behind the scene. Mm -hmm. But what we know, we are going to move, we are, we are going to have constant discussions about femicide at community level. Mimi tu mdemu community. Unawana, sauti yangu hata nikipaza aje, yezi jipaze fikie president, but I know somebody who can do it on behalf of us. Mm -hmm. For example, Pasaris came in the match and you saw mm -hmm. how everyone was like, ah, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult for her even to control the crowd. And everyone was expecting, editor, you can control this crowd. I was like, these people can beat me up. I'm not doing <laughs> it either. Mm -hmm. So I left it there. And I, I, I was just, the whole day I was just observing because I saw the anger mm. on the face of Kenyans. So what you are saying, uh, I'm looking at how system have been used against women and for the longest time, an African woman has been enslaved from a religious, religious point of view, whether it's Christianity or Islamic. Mm. And women have normalized certain things. For example, you talked about how we dress as women. Mm. Personally, I dress, my, my choices, must be respected sure. to anyone who is around me mm. and anyone outside there. So sometimes we, lo we look uh, looking at the cultural barriers, religious barriers, and how the Muzungu came in Africa and colonized us. Mm -hmm. And our men, because, you know, after colonization, the men were the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when men were the gatekeepers, men inherited what Muzungu was doing to the black people. Now, a, a, an African man took everything that was against what they were being done to and right now they're doing to an African woman. And it's difficult when you say, for example, I'm always a disruptor. Even at community level, at my family level, people don't like me. Me na pendo na kidogo sana. And uh, you will feel when you say no to anything as a woman, somebody will object, somebody will silence you. You are a woman, you are not, you are not supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. Women don't go to school in certain community we know mm. just because of what they have between their legs and uh, gender is not about men and women right now when we are conversing about this conversation we need also to have that in mind mm. we have queer people who identify differently we have intersex person who have been killed by the same same policies for the longest time but right now we are here and we're demanding for women rights let me tell you, it's not easy. Editor, but again, we can I, liberate I ourselves you. as women. So. I want to pause you for a bit. We've got to go to the news. Um, I'd like to ask that we continue this conversation in the next hour and get in feedback from the public. I'm seeing there's a lot of comments coming in as well from the public. And open up this discussion. What is it that we are dealing with as a society? Are we dealing with men hating women? Are we dealing with a section of a society hating another section of society? What exactly are we dealing with? This is the Situation Room.
the only way to start your day.